This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. We are audio only this week, but we're joined by our good friend, many of you know him, Michael Bolden from the Tenth Amendment Center. Uh, Michael and I both recently had the honor of speaking at an event in Dallas, Texas, held by the Abbeville Institute on one of our favorite topics, which is secession, decentralization, breaking up, uh, finding some sort of path to political subsidiarity in this country, because as we've seen, the midterms did not exactly heal any divisions among us. So, Michael, great to see you last weekend. Great to talk to you today. Yeah, it was really fun. And thank you for having me on to talk about this today, Jeff. Well, I want to talk about the event itself first. Um, just for the for the listeners, let me give a quick rundown. You know, I want to hand it to the Abbeville Institute. The, the participants were ideologically varied. Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick Sale was there. Many of you will know him as kind of an independent journalist who's been around a long time. And he is very much a left environmentalist in terms of his focus. And he talked about how uh, smaller polities might actually help us with what he sees, I don't necessarily agree, but with what, what he sees as an environmental calamity uh, with regards to climate change. Uh, uh, the aforementioned Michael Bolden was there. Alan Mendenhall was there. Many of you know him from Faulkner Law. He gave a great talk about Hayekian decentralization and how centralized big governments can't have the knowledge they need to be efficient. And uh, perhaps most importantly or most interestingly, uh, a gentleman that I've gotten to know named Marcus Ruiz Evans was there. He is a, a Californian. He describes himself as a left progressive. I think he's kind of on the moderate end of left progressivism, at least as it stands today. But nonetheless, you know, he makes a strong case for uh, Cal Exit, is, and he runs an organization called Yes California, modeled after the Yes people in Brexit. And uh, one of his arguments, I don't necessarily share it, is that because California is a net taxpayer rather than tax consumer with respect to Uncle Sam, that that surplus, were it to remain in California, could go a long way towards healing and paying for their uh, uh, overburdened welfare state. I'm not sure, Michael, that I believe him because he doesn't address the issue of pensions. And California has some unbelievable state county and local municipal pension liabilities in the future, uh, which are going to get pretty ugly. But nonetheless, um, you know, give me your thoughts on the conference. Well, I thought it was really interesting. And like you said, it was this kind of wide range of political viewpoints, all advocating for the same kind of solution. I particularly, not just to, because you're the host today, Jeff, but I particularly liked your presentation, this kind of thought experiment talking about how the Bay Area is basically the size of Switzerland. And why would we want, why would people, uh, a more free market, more liberty minded people want to force a liberty solution of, of health care on that area? If they want their socialism, let them do do it because if you don't, and I think the message you can take even further, if you don't allow people to make their own choices, good or bad, in their own area, in the way that they believe is right, then eventually they're going to want to try to make the decision for everybody because then that becomes the only way they can accomplish their goals. And I think Alan's speech uh, speaks to this as well. You don't learn what's good or bad when you have a one size fits all kind of quasi solution that's similar to what the left or the right wants. And you keep having this battle to control the entire pie instead of allowing people to learn and experiment uh, in their own communities. Yeah, but the, the midterms demonstrated nothing. And, and I think had there really been a big blue wave. Don't let, they always? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, from our perspective. But let's say the Dems had picked up 50 seats. And, and two or three Senate seats and were angling to beat Trump in 2020 and control all three so-called branches of government. I, I think that they would be dropping a lot of the federalism talk, a lot of the uh, secession talk, a lot of the let's break up talk. And there was a lot of it. Let's not forget, right after Trump won, there were articles in places like the New Republic. Uh, there was a, a, an, egg, an article called Blue Exit, um, which was all about, look – uh, these retrograde states full of deplorables can no longer be part of us. And, you know, that's often the philosophy of the team that thinks it's losing. The team that thinks it's winning is saying, look, why should we give up any territory? We're going to control the, the, the entirety of the United States. So it's going to be interesting to see. But 
I know you and I talked offline. There's a an unbelievable new article, and we'll link to it in in this podcast and on our YouTube page. Uh, in New York Mag, uh, the Intelligencer, as many of you will be familiar with that, uh, it's called "Divided We Stand," and it was written by a gentleman with whom I'm not familiar, named Sasha Eisenberg or Isenberg, and he really wrote a thorough and in-depth article, of, you know, sort of casting some scenarios uh, un- under which the, the the former U.S., now called the Federated Blue and Federated Red States, could actually exist. And, and he goes into a lot of really interesting, almost sci-fi examples of the future. You know, he talks about uh, health care, uh, right to work states. He talks about rail transportation, things like tariffs among not only the two federated states, but also foreign governments. He talks about our dealings with Mexico, our dealings with the Federal Reserve. He talks about the, the idea of maybe a hurricane comes across that affects both uh, federated territories. He talks about ag subsidies and tariffs and all kinds of things. So it, he really put some thought into it. And, uh, you know, I guess you've had a chance to read it, Michael. This this is the kind of thing that is is really uh, going to shock people out of their doldrums, I think. Well, it's it's interesting because it was right out of your speech, but taken to its conclusion, like where will this go in the future? It reads like a very interesting story. He's talking about uh, the governors of former red and former blue states. Basically, what he was talking about or proposing were states that had similar ideological viewpoints. And we know here on the coast that that's the way they are. Generally, uh, California, Oregon, Washington state would form these compacts under the Constitution agreements to do various things, interstate commerce and then plead to the uh, national government to give approval to it. Now, I think they should do it whether or not they get approval. I think people should make their choices. Uh, But he talks about this future where you can have governors that would generally be opposed, politicians who would generally be opposed, standing in front of the cameras, shaking, saying, you know what, we're not going to try to force our viewpoint on these people and they aren't going to do the same for us. And it is really, uh, you know, we were talking before we start recording here, it's 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 kind of a hopeful story. It's a hopeful story that instead of bad bashing everyone over the head every few years, uh, there's something in the future, whether you believe believe in progressive views, which I think, Jeff, you and I, we know that most of the listeners here probably do not, or if we believe in more liberty. There's a greater chance of having more liberty if we actually encourage the progressives to make their decisions in smaller geographic areas. And now this wasn't the only type of article that we've seen in the Trump era. Back uh, just in uh, early last year, there was an article in Slate magazine talking about basically nullification of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act as a model for states in response today uh, to Trump's immigration policies. So we see this more and more. And I think uh, clearly it is a partisan strategy. uh, But the more that they put out this type of strategy, I think the more that it will catch on within the grassroots, even if it's in small numbers. And it's uh, incumbent upon us to help uh, encourage that to grow, I believe. Well, you live in Los Angeles. What would you do if some scenario like this unfolded under Gavin Newsom and California implemented some deep blue wish list type things. What would you do? How would that affect your life? Well, I mean, I really like the food here and the weather is great. So, I mean, something about the lefties, there's great food options. I mean, if they start restricting that, we might have a different uh, thing going on. Uh, But they're already talking about single payer health care. There was a bill introduced in the last session here in California, SB 562, that would have done it. But instead, they decided to just study the cost. But now Newsom is on record saying he supports this. Clearly, there's no way to afford it. Uh, But I think they're going to start pushing in that direction. Direction. And even though I oppose single payer health care as an individual, I want to see some state do it and I want to see it show everyone else what a colossal failure it is. This is going to be better for the rest of the country, in my view. Yeah, well, they're talking about maybe four hundred billion dollars yeah, per think that year was to number. finance it. And of course, uh, Gavin Newsom is now, I think, at the point where he has uh, a two thirds majority in both um political bodies in California. Uh, So that's going to be very interesting to see if he boldly goes forward with a single payer system, whether he maybe boldly goes forward and attacks Prop 13, which a lot of our listeners will be familiar with, that caps property tax rates in California. So, and and frankly, I kind of hope he does. Um, If that's what, if that's what, in other words, as libertarians, at what point do we start to say that universal political precepts are, are few and far between? 
It also goes back to Alan Mendenhall, Mendenhall's speech uh, uh, last week, Saturday. This is about knowledge. So how can we prove to people how bad these ideas are until they're put into practice? We can show them uh, man, economy and state till we're blue in the face, uh, but they're not going to read it and they're not going to believe it because they are really wedded to the idea that government uh, provided services, I guess we can call them, are really the way to go. So if they don't actually do it and they don't learn the bad results, results, then it's never going to change. So we should encourage this type of thing to happen. Now, California could, a California economic collapse could create ripple effects clearly, but that's outside of my realm. Whether it's California or Vermont or someone else, we want to see people redirect their political energy inward and uh, make their decisions more locally or on a state level, at least uh, for the time being. And of course, none of us, whether there was an actual outright secession or just a, a greater degree of federalism granted to California or taken by California, none of us want to see California struggle. That would affect all of us. Uh, we have a, a highly interconnected, interdependent economy, for example. Um, no matter what business you're in, you're, pro you're probably either selling or buying tangentially. Uh, for, and certainly from the knowledge sector based in Silicon Valley, there's this, you know, Michael, there's this idea that, that we have to be at odds and we're only at odds politically. We're not at odds commercially. As a matter of fact, we're codependent. Mm, that's a yeah. That that I mean, I think that sums it up because I, I think it was maybe Ron Paul who said a few years ago talking about uh, the foreign policy belligerence towards Iran. I mean, no one wakes up in the morning thinking about a Persian person worried about whether or not they have to kill that person uh, because they're just human beings, uh, just like us Californians are just as human as you are down in Alabama, of course, too. Well, you know, in my talk, I did basically stress baby steps, uh, ways we could all uh, achieve what we would consider in our local areas, greater degrees of political freedom without outright secession. One of the points I made was that uh, America is a graying country and it's it's set to have to, to double the amount of people over 65 over the next 30 years. So, so to me, that, that counsels that we're probably not going to have a shooting war, which is a very happy mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing, if that's true. And I certainly hope we don't have a shooting war. But, you know, give me some of Michael Bolden's thoughts. What are some of the baby steps? What are some of the technical or pragmatic ways that a, a California could carve out what it wants or more of what it wants short of secession? Well, I, I might be a one trick wonder here, but my speech and my presentation, wherever I go, it always goes back to one word and it's marijuana. We've seen California start a trend where they ca carved out something for an issue that the people of this state wanted to do, even though all the branches of the federal government has been against them. And even the Supreme Court in 2005 in a case called Gonzalez versus Raich held that a state marijuana law uh, really didn't matter because federal law is always supreme. And the Controlled Substances Act uh, says that uh, the federal law uh, bans marijuana. But today we now have 33 states and the most recent ones are West Virginia, Utah, Oklahoma and Missouri that are defying one size fits all diktats from Washington, D.C. on a plant. Well, why not put that same uh, that same blueprint into effect for something else. I think as long as people start legalizing what the federal government pro uh, prohibits, whether it's a plant or a gun or something else or a policy that the federal government doesn't want, uh, then when you have enough people doing that, there's not much that they can really do to force their one size fits all solution on them. But why is there still so much progressive hostility to, to the idea of nullification, which has been used against slavery laws? It's now being used against immigration laws at the federal level, against marijuana laws at the federal level. I mean, this think progress guy, which we, we, regardless of your politics, is a really loathsome uh, uh, activist, hacktivist type publication. Think progress guy shows up at the Abbeville Institute's conference and, of course, immediately uh, basically mislabels Michael Bolden. Yeah, you know, and I've had dealings with Think Progress for many years, and they basically do the exact same thing. Mind you, if I talk to someone at the New York Times, even if they're ideologically opposed to me, they'll walk up to me, hand me a business card, say, I'm so-and-so, I'm with the New York Times, I'd like to ask you some questions. They tell me who they are, 
who they're reporting for. Think progress. It doesn't matter who the reporter has been. They use the same tactic. They walk up to you. They don't tell you their full name. They say their first name. They say they're just a blogger. They're reporting on things. And you have to ask them repeatedly over and over and over before they actually tell you who they're writing for because they're obfuscating. They're trying to hide. They're trying to lead you into an answer for a question. He was trying to get me to say something in support of the new uh, acting attorney general, Whitaker. Uh, I don't know anything about him. I'm assuming that with the track record of appointing a guy like Jeff Sessions or considering a guy like Chris Christie, the current person probably can't be all that good either. So what they do is they try to lead you into something. They hide who they're writing for. And when they tell you who they're writing for and you call them out on it, uh, they never quote you on anything. So I gave a speech that had many things that were appealing to people in, from a conservative kind of end of the spectrum. And also from the progressive, I talked about weed for like 20 minutes. I talked about ending surveillance. I talked about the warfare state. I mentioned Hillary Clinton and Rosa Parks. But the Think Progress people aren't interested in presenting information or quotes from someone that might appeal to their readers. They only want to keep people in partisan boxes. And it's really, uh, they're slime balls. I mean, for, for lack of a better phrase. But is this something that we can a actively push or move toward, or is this something that just has to unfold? It's kind of like libertarianism itself. Uh, Stefan Kinsella often says, look, libertarianism is going to happen if it does because of technology and because of inexorable changes, not because of our sort of fulminating about it and agitating for it. Do, do you feel like a, the, the same way about a potential political uh, subdivision in America? Well, I believe decentralization can actually happen with a push. It's already happening in Ron Paul during his campaign, the 20, the second one. I think he was talking about we should expect a, a speech in Phoenix, Arizona. We should expect a basically a de facto nullification. In essence, they can't continue doing what they're doing in every aspect of their life forever. And sooner or later, People are going to start making decisions on various issues in their own states, in their own communities, well, no matter what Washington, D.C. has to say. We try to give that a nice little push. And so when articles come out in The Intelligencer or in Slate, we like, like to work with people who are open to the idea of advancing their own ideology in their own area. And then we do all kinds of legislative activity on a state and a local level. We do an annual report that's about 80 pages long that talks about our successes and the challenges on issues like asset forfeiture, surveillance, gun control, health care freedom, uh, marijuana prohibition, hemp farming, all across the political spectrum where things are actually moving forward or I guess we could say moving inward in a more decentralized way. And so with a little bit push, it can happen. And I'm not talking about just like debating people on Facebook because I don't think that really has much of an effect. People are kind of locked into their own land, but actually going out and doing things. I love agorists, to be honest with you, people who are doing things. And when you can actually create businesses that uh, government says that you shouldn't do or you shouldn't do without their permission, and then the world doesn't come to an end, maybe someone who interacts with that business starts thinking, you know what, that isn't a bad thing for this person to have a hot dog cart in Los Angeles without a government permission. And we actually saw that play out here in LA, where there's hundreds of people mostly uh, run by immigrants. Many of them are, quote, illegal, I would assume. And there's all kinds of people earning a living for a small living, I guess, selling hot dogs without a government health inspection license. And the city tried to sh shut them down. And after this has been entrenched in the culture here, this the people of the city totally rejected the idea and the government hasn't been able to stop them. That's a small example. But I think the more that people start doing things without getting permission from government first, the more that other people will learn that we don't necessarily need government in all these parts of our lives. Well, where can people find your annual report, your 80 page report? It's 10th Amendment Center com slash report. It's updated through the end of uh, 2017. We're in the process of finalizing the latest version, which will be out at the uh, probably the end of the month. You know, another thing I mentioned during my talk was the late, the the turn of the century journalist, Garrett Garrett, he lived from about the 1850s in, into the, the 1900s. He was a huge critic of FDR and the New Deal. And he, he didn't coin the phrase, but he used the, the phrase and, the, and the, the idea of a revolution within a form and within mm -hmm. the form. In other words, FDR was uh, basically overturning the government in America, but he was doing it using the Supreme Court and constitutional niceties and, and using some of the same terminology uh, so that people accepted it. You know, one of the 
things about your work is we, we can have a revolution with just the mechanisms we already have within the form itself of the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, uh, the, the, the principles of federalism laid out in the Constitution, whether you're a big fan of the Constitution or not. In other words, we can have more of what Michael Bolden or, or what I might want here and now without any kind of uh, real technical revolution in law. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, it doesn't matter whether or not they change the law on a lot of these things in practice. For example, we know, again, that Washington, D.C. considers the marijuana plant illegal in every situation. You can't have it for commercial purposes. Yet here in Los Angeles alone, there are 700 businesses uh, where you can go and purchase this illegal product. So the law hasn't been changed, at least in Washington. Certainly, we know that having laws changed on a state or a local level helps things. It, it gets people who are on the margins, who are afraid to challenge the status quo. It gives them the political cover to actually step out and do something. But on top of that, there are hundreds of more of those same businesses that aren't even registered on a state or a local level. So it encourages more people to expand that gray market, that true free market beyond what's even authorized on, a, on the, uh, the local level. So the more that this happens, we have to worry less and less about this far off beast that is Washington. Uh, whether or not they have their laws on the books, we can keep advancing freedom. Well, I agree. There are laws. There are Supreme Court decisions, though, that that do create a sense of form amongst people. Yes. And here's the pain. Here's the rub. And it applies to everybody. Everybody has to accept the pain. For example, Brian McClanahan will tell you the Second Amendment, a Second Amendment doesn't apply to states. No one who signed the Constitution would have thought it did, which means... Uh, gun lovers like myself, hey, California can have its own gun control. Uh, it also means that we don't have to have a one-size-fits-all abortion rule, which is a, an issue we're never going to solve. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get 320 million people to come to agreement on whether a, a fetus is a human and whether it has the same rights as a, as a, as a born baby and, and, and all this and that. Um, so there's, there's, there's pain, there's give and take to making this work. And that's that's the rub. Well, I believe, and I think that it's the great Mencken quote, uh, I believe in liberty, but not enough to force it on anyone. And certainly there are millions upon millions of people who don't believe that we have a natural right. And I don't like the term constitutional right or Second Amendment right, because that implies that we get these rights uh, from a piece of paper, which is absurd, of course. But we they, they believe that we don't have a natural right to defend ourselves, our property, our family, et cetera. And if we don't allow them to do what they want to do in their own area, they're going to force their views on everyone. Again, I think the, the process, uh, the understanding, the learning that Mendenhall talked about, it all applies on every issue. Uh, so let's say California has 100 percent gun control, uh, but Nevada has none. Well, maybe people in Nevada will be able to be seen as safer than those in California. I mean, I believe that's how it'll play out. But the Californians who live down the street from me or are right across the, the hall from me uh, in my apartment building, they wouldn't believe that today. They need to see it play out in practice. And I want to encourage that to happen in as many places as possible. Yeah, the interesting thing there would be what does California do when when its own residents or citizens drive to Nevada, buy uh, AR-15s, and then transport them back into California. I guess. exactly what will happen. That's what happens on <laughs> illegal cigarettes between Kentucky and Tennessee today. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly what happens. Well, Michael, uh, tell us just real briefly how people can follow you and Tenth Amendment Center online and, and keep abreast with this. And I'm going to preface this with, please... Go to our site, or excuse me, go to the link that we're going to provide and read this article in the Intelligencer magazine because it's really going to blow you away. And also, we're going to post over the weekend Alan Mendenhall's great talk at the Abbeville Conference called Decentralization and the Pro Problem of Knowing. It's really uh, quite a poignant and, and lengthy talk that he gave, and it's well worth your time out. So I'm going to say both those articles are well worth your time. But also well worth your time is following Michael and the Tenth Amendment Center. So tell us how. The best place to go is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. That way people can learn about our philosophical underpinnings. We have a, a, this entire uh, project that we release annually, and then they can see the successes. And of course, there's social media links if people want to follow us on social as well or get our email newsletter, et cetera. But that's the starting point.
Well, I'm a big fan of your organization. It's one of the few that I follow uh, closely, and I wish you all the best success. I wish people like Marcus Ruiz Evans all the best success because the last thing I think any of us want is for things to get any uglier politically in this country. And that is, of course, the nature of the state and the nature of politics, which is nothing more than a turf battle over who gets to control the apparatus of that state. So that said, Michael Bolden, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.